So uh, what I'd like to do today, this is kind of a getting started with Docker. Um, you know, they, they, I was asked to kind of go over Docker um, and, and, you know, from what would a network engineer want to know. And I guess the, for the first part, it would be basically, you know, how, what is, why Docker? You know, why is all this excitement over Docker? Um, and we'll talk about what the Docker platform and um, We'll go through some installation scenarios, talk about installation in general. Um, and then I've got three workflows, um, kind of a basic workflow, uh, which is where literally you just basically want to find an image that you're, you're kind of quasi aware of. Like, for example, I might look for an Nginx or Ubuntu or uh, CentOS or Fedora, and then I can basically find, I'm going to show you how you find that image how you actually get to run that image, what that looks like. Um, the second scenario is where you want to build your own image. So we have this, uh, you know, a loosely defined DSL called a Docker file, um, and we'll talk about a little bit about that and, and how you can go through building an image, storing it. Um, and then, um, then we'll talk about a third workflow, which is how do you interact with volumes and a little bit about the image structure an architecture of an image in Docker. And, and that covers a fair amount of ground. Um, I noticed we had an hour and a half, so we'll see how this goes. This was basically a presentation that was designed for an hour. Um, we, we can add some fat into some of the examples. I'm going to do some uh, live demos, you know, if the demo gods actually behave. Um, and then uh, finally, I'll take uh, parts of what I've been doing for, on a kind of Docker networking presentation. So I've added some slides to this presentation. So that should get us a good hour and 15 minutes, hopefully, knock on wood, and leave us maybe 15 or 20 minutes for questions. All right, that's the agenda. So um, the one thing I did want to mention is on the Docker blog, um, so uh, I, uh, this week, um, actually, um, the acquisition of my socket plane company is about four months old. Um, and what I've been doing for really basically the last three months is I've been creating a, a tutorial series, um, 10 to 20 minute um, tutorials, uh, going over all aspects of the product. So there's so a lot of the things that we're going to talk about here. I have more in depth, very uh, you know kind of gory detail demo. So I, I you know if if this sparks your interest, I would definitely go back and. Um, and look at the tutorials. It's to Docker blog, and then you just find me, John Willis, in their tutorial one, two. I just finished the whole series of products, so basically from install all the way up to some of our newer offerings like Compose, Swarm, and Machine. And I'll talk a little about those. Um, I actually don't have slides for those, but we can kind of make slides up as we go near the end if we have time. So anyway, the point is a lot of this stuff comes from the, the, the blog, Docker blog tutorial series. Um, there's also a, a working uh, file, like a GIST file, if you're familiar with that, that has all the commands that I run, too. So that's another good thing about, about following the tutorial. So let's talk about um, why Docker. Um, so, you know, you, you'll get a lot of stories on why Docker, and, and I, I've broken it down really to kind of five things that I think that are important. And the first is isolation. Um, you know, so pretty much, you know, when you run uh, Docker containers, uh, basically, the idea is that you can run pretty much any app anywhere. That's kind of the concept. Um, you know, even Windows now. So we we actually even support Windows as an architecture. Um, we say if it works locally, it's going to work on any server. Now, again, there there can be some complexities and based on the based host operating system and the operating system that the uh, container is built with. So in the end, if you're familiar with containers, um, there. Um, Docker is built on the concept of LXC uh, as, as part of it. Um, these concepts have been around for a while. Uh, Jails, uh, Truth, and then, you know, if anybody who's worked with uh, Solaris Zones, right? So this is not a new concept. Um, so, but, but the idea, once you kind of contain, you know, in this case, run a container or build a container, um, you're, you're not, um, you, you, it's kind of a bit for bit uh, structure, right? So that it's um, the version, the distro, dependencies, those things don't change. Um, the code paths are native, right? And and in the end, um, these things run as processes. So, uh, which leads me to the second bullet, which is um, it's lightweight. Uh, it's an order of magnitude of compute instances 
um, lighter, right? What you don't have is you don't have the host. It shares the kernel and the host operating system. So, um, so you get these lower footprints in disk and memory. You get incredibly fast boot times. You know, a container can boot in like 400, 500 milliseconds. Uh, VM might boot anywhere from one, two to three minutes, depending on the, the virtualization provider. Um, so, uh, so again, again, a very uh, lightweight architecture, um, isolation, lightweight. And so at this point, you'd say, well, isn't that just the definition of Linux containers or containers in general? And I would say, yes, that's true. So why Docker? So that's where we get into kind of the simplicity argument. So what Docker has done is it's not just Linux containers. They've combined a whole bunch of reasonably complex Linux um, features into one simple installable model. So they use things like C groups, kernel namespaces, um, and they bundle that all in. Uh, it's kind of funny, uh, about two and a half years ago, before um, they actually did kind of their pivot, they started playing with the idea of, of creating Docker in a private repo. And a friend of mine um, introduced me to Solomon. He's the founder, Solomon Hikes. And, and, and Solomon gave me access to the repo. And prior to that, I had been kind of a frustrated running container person. I, I would say there's this uh, Gene Kim, who I work with, the Phoenix Project author, he says there's the unicorns and there's the horses. And, um, and I've always been considered myself a horse. Um, and when I tried to do um, containers on AWS, you know, about two and a half years ago before I tried Docker, um, it, I gave up. It was just too much. And that was just to get the containers working. And, and Amazon had some idiosyncrasies with the type of kernel you had. But the point is, when I, when I met Solomon and I got access to the, the original Docker repo, um, literally in like less than about six minutes from the readme to an app get and then Docker run, I was running a container. Um, and that, that is the experience that most people have, that you can actually um, literally install this thing in a couple of minutes and then literally, if you know what you're doing, just say Docker run and you're running a container. You know, so um, another, um, you know, important point of Docker, you know, why Docker is, um, this is an important point too. Is I, I just call it generically workflow, but there was some clever foo, if you will, in the way they were thinking about putting this together. So they did not only just took like um, some reasonably complex Linux concepts, you know, C groups, kernel, um, you know, isolation and namespaces, kernel namespaces, those kind of things, and combine that with LC. Th there's two things they did in the workflow. One is they used the workflow very similar to Git. So they did this kind of pull, push, commit model. And they combine that with using what's called a union file system. Um, they, today, the default is AUFS, but there's also all sorts of supported uh, union-based file systems. And these systems have, the ones that are used primarily with Docker, have a characteristic of something called copy on write. And when we get to the volume section, I'll go over this in a little more detail. But um, what, it, what it allows is not only the idea that you can kind of encapsulate a binary image and then say, I want to run this image as a container, but it has this layering of uh, a layered file system so that you can add things. And, and it, it really gets exciting if you want to use this for things like continuous delivery pipelines, those kind of things. So, um, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of uh, Union file system or just the in image architecture when we get the volume. So, so again, I, I think if people, a lot of people say, well, uh, well, Docker isn't it just Linux containers. So I'm like, yeah, uh, but it's you know it's a complex set of of kind of um, Linux features like C groups, namespaces. It's also they've done some clever stuff in the workflow, and then kind of last but not least is the um, the community aspect. I, you know, I, you know, I was saying earlier, I'm an old I'm an old guy, right? I'm you know 35 years in this business and I, I've seen nothing like um, what's been going on with Docker in, in, in from a viral standpoint. I, I've seen some, I, I was ninth person in at Chef and I thought that was viral uh, back in the day and I, I've seen nothing like this with what's going on with Docker. And I, I just highlighted some of the, um, the current metrics, you know, DockerCon is next week so you're going to probably see a lot more updates but I I grabbed, uh, our CEO did a blog back in April, um, plus I just grabbed some of the latest data. 
that I could find. The, the ones that I think are really interested in is, um, you know, there's 400 million Docker engine downloads. Um, supposedly at the beginning of this year, there were only 200 million. So you got to, you know, in April we were two years old. Um, you know, so um, basically prior to two years we have about 200 million downloads, and now, you know, within the last six months we've doubled that, right? So and that's been pretty much the trajectory of almost every metric about Docker. Um, and then um, the, I think the other one that always uh, I always think is pretty interesting is the how many developers use Docker, like three to four million developers are using Docker. And you can see the companies, uh, including Cisco, I think uh, Cisco's not in there, but you, you guys have been pretty aggressive at working with Docker, um, and along with some other, you know, big names and also some web scale companies. So anyway, that's kind of the why Docker, um, you know, give you a context of, you know, what, what, what we've done technically. And I say we, I've been here for a month, I guess I can say we now. I, I, I get yelled at when I keep saying they, so uh, I'll say we from here on in, even though I had very little to do with this, all the success. Um, anyway, so um, again, the, technically I think there was some clever um, ideas put together to, to make um, something that's reasonably complex very simple. Um, all right, so the next section um, is, you know, where, where I describe is kind of the Docker platform. And so there's really two major components with the Docker platform is what's called the Docker engine and the Docker hub. And this basically is what we call the Docker platform. And so we'll go through each of these. Uh, the Docker engine is um, really, so what happens is Docker ships as um, a single binary written in Go. Um, and this binary actually acts as the kind of service and the client. It's kind of interesting. That same binary is actually, so depending on the flags that you specify or, you know, if you set up um, service control for the, the, the actual binary with the flags to specify that you want to run it as a daemon, um, if you just put it in your path, you know, use a local bin docker, then it becomes your CLI as well, depending on the flag, or the commands that you run, and we'll see that. So, so again, I think it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a little interesting that the, this one binary is both the, uh, the 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 service, you know, the daemon, if you will, and the CLI. Uh, the CLI, I think, um, we one dot ship one <laughs> one dot seven shipped, I think, yesterday or maybe Tuesday, um, and um, and I think I counted it still thirty nine commands. I think one dot six was definitely thirty nine commands, and. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about some of the things that I know about that are in 1.7. A lot of a lot of the interesting stuff that dropped in 1.7 is uh, network stuff, and we'll talk about that near the end. All right. So the Docker daemon um, basically is responsible uh, for three primary things. I'm sure there's other things, but um, it, it's uh, responsible for building images. So that's that second workflow we're gonna we're gonna kind of demo and walk through. Um, you know, Docker has a way for you to um, kind of describe in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of, I would say it's a loosely defined DSL, it's called a Docker file, um, and then you use that and it'll build an image. And we'll talk a lot more about that. And, um, and so it, that daemon manages that process. It also, as you can imagine, manages the running or stopping, pausing, killing of containers. So basically all your kind of container-based commands and of course, it has a RESTful API. So that that's the primary responsibility of the daemon. Um, and then um, this, like I said, there's 39 um, CLI commands. Um, I, I, I didn't print them all out. Uh, the ones that these are ones that you you'll see kind of more often than not. Probably the 80 percent, you know, of of the of what you wind up using. The Docker build again. We'll we'll see this earlier. This is how you you basically specify a Docker file as input, specify the name of the image you want to create. Uh, the Docker images will list all your images on a host, and then um, and then the Docker run is uh, how you run an instance. And again, we're going to demo this. The Docker PS command um, is uh, is kind of like a, a Linux PS, but it's a it shows you all the running or stopped instances. 
so it'll show you basically which what's what are all the instances running on a particular host. I, I keep saying Docker host. Um, there's a slide coming up later, but I can imagine that some people that are really brand new to this um, think of a Docker host as pro, uh, as like a hypervisor server without the hypervisor. So basically, you you pick a host, and you would have many of these, of course, and you'd install the Docker engine on it. You install Docker. And then you would run containers on that host, and you would have you know multiple hosts running lots of containers. Uh, we won't delve too much into orchestration, but maybe near the end I'll, I'll have some time and I can talk about some of the orchestration tools that allow you to manage containers across multiple Docker hosts. Um, and then there's the Docker stop. There's also a Docker kill. But, um, and then the the Docker RM and the Docker RMI. I'll, I'll explain a little bit of differences. Um, so when you run, say you Docker run in a container, uh, because of this copy on write feature, if you are hadn't like create a directory or add some stuff to it, it's kind of ephemeral in that um, anything that you do will stay around, and you can actually stop the container and restart it. There's a restock or restart command. You can start, stop, and then stop it or restart it. And all those changes will live in that container. And they'll live in that, that container image until you do um, a Docker RM. You know, in other words, you can have, again, you can have a, the, the state of a, um, a container could be running or stopped, or it could be paused and stopped. Because a pause is very similar to stop. Um, but once you do the RM, you basically remove you know, basically everything. So unless you copied off the data, from that uh, from that container, then that will be lost. The last Docker the Docker RMI is how you remove an image from that host, and we'll see this more clearly in the demos if this is not making sense. But basically, um, you will have multiple images on a host, and you run an image, and, and we'll see that we can get images from the Docker Hub and all that good stuff. And so here's a, you know a, a picture from our website of you know kind of a a higher level architecture diagram. I talked about a Docker host. It's some um, machine that you're running, um, and you install Docker on it. Docker daemon runs as a service. You start and stop as many containers that reasonably fit. Um, and then, by default, the Docker binary as a client talks to the Docker daemon through uh, TCP sockets. That can be done on the same host or across hosts through the network. Um, and then uh, as you know, what is not depicted in this particular diagram is you can also use the Docker RESTful API to talk to the Docker daemon. As you see there, the, there's the Docker pull command, the Docker run command. So that, that's kind of the high level uh, architecture of, uh, of how Docker works. And so the Docker hub. Um, by default, we have a SAS that runs this Docker Hub SAS, and I'll demo this here in a bit. And uh, it provides uh, Docker services. The primary service that the Docker Hub SAS provides is a library for images. And so you can store um, vendors store their images in there. So there's a bunch of um, public images from all sorts of like you canonical or Nginx or different organizations or different people. Uh, you can store your own images. If they're public, they can be stored for free without cost. If they're private, then there's a cost associated with that. Um, and then there's, um, there's also an automated build process. So a lot of people now will actually do their kind of Jenkins process. They'll do a commit, the Jenkins process. They'll actually um, use a Docker file or dynamically build a Docker file to build an image. And in fact, I'm seeing more and more products actually ship with um, a, as a Docker image. In fact, I demoed a product this morning. It was pretty clever. Uh, the whole product was a Docker um, image. So literally, I was able to uh, um, do a Docker pull of the image, follow their readme. I literally was able to run and test their, um, their product out in about three minutes. Um, so now there's, um, I'm not going to go into to, uh, right now, I'm just covering what's called the Docker Hub, which is basically our SaaS. There's two variants of this. There's a reference architecture for the open source Docker Hub that you can run locally 
on your in your own site. And there's some really good documentation in our doc site, and some people have written good uh, blog articles on how to do that. So some people will do that. And then we've recently announced the Docker Hub Enterprise. So this is a pay for a service where it will actually give you, you know, kind of all the um, all the bakings of our SaaS that you can run internally in your site. And there's been a lot of excitement about this. So a lot of customers have been pretty excited about the uh, Enterprise Hub. So it's uh, um, because the the one thing I, I think I, I should mention at this point is, you know, the thing that you want to if you start using Docker, you know, if you're testing Docker out in a kind of a uh, a, a sandbox or a playground, you, you pull images, you can do what you want. Uh, a lot of people question, well, what, you know, is it dangerous to pull Docker images? Um, you know, this is really kind of not a lot different from how you would use anything else when you pull it from the Internet. Um, if you're going to just pull things from the Internet, you probably want to ha have some special hygiene in place in your organization to understand those things you pull. This is no different from Chef Cookbooks. This is no different from uh, Puppet Manifests. Uh, so what you'll find is, you know, people who are have moving kind of up the chain of working their, their kind of production implementations of Docker, they're actually kind of running their internal hubs. They're actually building their base images. They're not allowing their customers to just pull out, you know, anything that touches anything production. They're not allowing people to just pull any image. They have to start from kind of a sanctioned organizational, and, and we'll see this when I get into the uh, building images, or, you know, how you can build your own images, how you can build your own base images, supply those to your developers, and all that good stuff. And then the Docker Hub, this is, a, this is the GUI of the Docker Hub. It's hub.docker.com, and uh, when, we'll, when, when I demo here in a minute, we'll see. So, um, so I wanted to kind of just, I'm not going to do the installation. I've already done the installation in the demo. Um, there's um, a number of ways to install Docker. Uh, the simplest uh, way to install is you can just um, wget against get.docker.com, pipe it to sh. Um, if you're a little concerned about piping a script from the Internet into a shell, you could obviously just pull it and output to a file and then take a look at it. Um, but that this will get you, will always guarantee get you the latest install. Um, and then um, we've already uh, pushed 1.7, but as we get to 1.8, as it gets closer, you can always pull the, the next release at test.target.com. Um, you can also do the native installs, right? So on Ubuntu, uh, you can do an app get install uh, docker.io. On the Red Hat derivatives, you can do the yum install. Um, you got to be careful, depending on your default repository, you might get a back-level Docker. Um, last time I tried the Ubuntu on the 14.10 by default, you get like 1.5. Um, now, we create all the packages, and that's all in our installation documentation. So you could basically point to uh, where we're keeping our RPMs or Debian packages, and you can use your native install by updating repositories. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so that's your basic installation. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I mean, the... the um, you know, for kind of homework, if you will. You know, if this has intrigued you, I think I would really recommend the Docker blogs that I put together, these tutorial series. Um, and so, so that's your basic installation. And like I said, I've already installed Docker um, um, on, on my Mac. I'm running uh, Vagrant and Ubuntu right now. So, so let's talk about this uh, first workflow problem or opportunity. And it's really simple, right? I, again, I'm just going from kind of zero to 15 to 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. Um, you know, I have this notion that, all right, so somebody told me I could do something really quick with Docker. Um, uh, you know, so I follow the, the steps to do the quick install. I'm familiar with Ubuntu, so let me see what that looks like. I'll find, see what if I can find it on the Docker Hub. Uh, once I find it, I might want to do a pull. And then uh, depending, and we'll walk through this, depending if I look at the image, inspect it a little bit, I might go ahead and uh, run the image, stop the image, remove the image. So it's just a very simple workflow. Um, and here I'll show the commands, and then we'll run them online. But So there's a Docker search command. In fact, in 1.7, it just got smoking fast. <laughs> so uh, 
it was actually I, I wasn't a big fan of search because it was kind of slow. It looks like they really cleaned it up in one seven. Um, if you take, for example, Docker search Ubuntu, um, prior to one that seven, you just got a whole lot of hits. It looks like they've done some cleanup. Um, they must have put like a default counter because it looks like I was only getting like ten now. Which so I had always got used this hack where this dash s on the search is how many stars so people can actually star an image like oh I think this is great let me get five stars let me get four stars and you could basically kind of weed out the kind of junk by putting a threshold of anything ten or above um, and so I find the Ubuntu one and then I do a Docker pull Ubuntu and now the one thing I want to tell you is um, the the images have kind of um, two parts to it it has the image name and then um, and then there's a tag part of it. So typically you'll have image name, in this case Ubuntu, colon, and then some tag. If you don't use a tag, the default is colon latest. So in this case, I'm doing a Docker pull Ubuntu. It's going to pull whatever in the official or if, whatever, um, whatever the, I'm sorry, the Docker hub considers the latest for that name. Um, and I think this happens to be 14.04. Um, that will get updated at some point to 15, but for now it's still 14. I'll pull it. So again, beware that. Um, the, and in this case, it's quite simple. I'm okay with just pulling the default latest, but if you have to be exact, make sure you specify the tag. And we'll see this in Hub. And then I can use the Docker images to show um, all the images that I have loaded. Another thing I like to do when I pull an image is there's a history command. And, and we'll see this. You can actually take a look a little bit at the meta in the image, and more, and probably more importantly, show you what command that particular image is going to run. Right? Just something you might want to see. And now, if I'm okay with all that, then I'm going to go do this Docker run command, and I'm encapsulating that in a variable. So I'm saying uh, CID equals dollar, and then I've got the run command. So I want to talk about two things. Um, the, um, every time you do a Docker run, it creates a 64-character uh, container ID. And so in this case, I'm actually just grabbing the container ID in the variable, and I'm going to use that later. Um, I also will see in a later workflow example, I can use a dash dash name and give it a specific name that I want. So there's a number of ways to reference a container, but in this case, uh, since I'm not giving it a name, um, I'm going to capture the, the, the the container ID. The other thing that's important about this Docker run is, and I spend a lot of time in that um, in the tutorials on this, is that I, dash it flag. So the the dash i says that it's going to take standard in input. The dash t, and you combine them all together. The dash t says that it will actually run um, a pseudo terminal, tty terminal. So if you actually wanted to um, attach into a container and you know and navigate around and then the dash d uh, says that it's going to run in detached mode so it's going to run as a, a detached process so i'm saying docker run take standard in run makes sure it it is a tty and run in detached mode and run the image called ubuntu that we run in i do docker ps um, before we go into the demo, a couple more things. Uh, looks like there's a nasty storm coming here in, a, in uh, North Atlanta, so uh, hopefully that doesn't get in our way here. I'm hearing a lot of lightning and thunder out there. Um, the, uh, the Docker exec is pretty cool. I think this was added in Docker 1.5. It's really used as a troubleshooting tool. Um, when I first got the Docker, I started using this for everything, and one of the developers was like, you do know that's a, a, a debugging tool. Like oh okay but but uh, so what happens is in that case that 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 uh, Docker container is running that Ubuntu one I started I can actually execute a process in it for uh, troubleshooting so a, a good example I'd just say Docker exec use the container ID variable and just do an IPA to get the IP address I can stop it remove it um, run Docker images should be fine so let's do the um, let's do the demo. <coughs> Okay, so uh, first things first, let's just do, uh, let's take a look at our environment here. Like I said, I'm running Vagrant, so I've got a, a Ubuntu on the Vagrant. Let's just do a Docker V. I've got uh, 1.7, which literally just got dropped Tuesday. 
uh, Docker info. Here's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm running zero containers. I've got a bunch of images. It tells me, uh, remember I talked about the union file system, it tells me what file system, union file system I'm using, um, memory, all sorts of good stuff, okay? So the, the example I, I used earlier is I wanted to find a Ubuntu image. So to do a search, like I said, this wasn't this fast at 1.6. Um, and one of the things you want to look for and, and is, is it an official image? And then, um, you know, and then the, like I said, I was using that kind of dash S, uh, um, I guess I could say dash S 100. And that's only going to give me back the, the one, right? So then, uh, so I found that. Let's do a Docker pull. Now, if, I've, if I already have the image, the pull will run really fast because it really won't pull it. So, so I actually have already preloaded this. So, um, so it, it just came back up really fast. In fact, if I do Docker images, I've actually loaded a couple. I loaded the Ubuntu. So notice it has the tag latest here. So I could have pulled, and we'll see. I'll go into the hub here in a minute. But I also called, I, I pulled down Nginx, and then I'll talk a little bit about BusyBox here. So um, so let's do the Docker history on uh, a couple of things here. It shows me um, actually what command it's going to execute. Uh, when we get to the Docker file, I'll show you that there's a there's a primitive called CMD in the Docker file that is the what is going to be the command that runs when you run this instance. And then there's some other stuff that's in here. Um, let's um, let's go ahead and uh, run. The, uh, let's see what we got. So uh, let's do. Uh, Equal dollar run dash itd oh gotta be able to spell there's the sid number if I do a docker ps tells me a lot more about it um, you can also um, do things with the um, a shortened container ID. So it basically, when you're referencing the container, like if I, um, if I want to do a Docker inspect, let's say, which is another interesting command, I can actually take any recognizable part of the container ID. So but the Docker inspect gives you a lot of information. So notice I just cut it off at uh, Charlie 07 there. So I, I can grab kind of any part of that. I mean, the safe bet is to at least use the uh, 12 character. Um, let's go clear this. I know there were some questions. I know Igor has been uh, had a couple himself. Um, so there was a question about you know how do you limit the, the CPU, the memory, and, and those kinds of things on the containers. Uh, there, are, there are ways to do that with different flags. And the, whenever you do Docker run, you can specify those things. So when you start, start looking at some of the frameworks that are available for Docker, um, that, that's one of the things they end up doing, right? They're able to, to do that orchestration and those limitations on a, a wider basis. I'm doing my best Docker expert impression here. Um, you know, one of the questions was whenever, okay, so it's pretty confusing because we're saying that there are, he, in his example, he was saying, okay, get Docker run Ubuntu, right? But every time we've been told about containers, we say, well, you don't run operating systems within the, this uh, Docker idea, right? You run containers, you run small images, you run processes, you don't actually run a full operating system. So it's a little bit odd whenever you say, okay, go pull Ubuntu down because it makes it sound like it's an entire host. Uh, that's not actually what's happening. So you're not actually running an entire operating system. You're not pulling down like a Ubuntu virtual machine when that happens. I know it confused me when I first started learning this stuff. Um, so what you're actually pulling down is, is each Docker file is basically just a set of, or each Docker container is a set of files. So you can actually go inspect the file structure of that. And, you know, because everything in Linux is a file, 
all that's really happening is that there's a bunch of libraries and files and uh, modules and all those kinds of things you would need to run images on top of Ubuntu. So yeah, whenever you run a Docker image, it's not actually running an operating system. It is running a specific process for that. Uh, let's see here. There was another question on, you know, what do we do around uh, malicious containers in the Docker Hub? So I, I know I was in a Docker class a while back and this, this question came up. And the, the question or the answer to that is it's not simple, right? Because anyone can push containers to the Docker Hub. Um, and even then, the files there are not really run through any security, uh, you know, tests or anything. So there, there can absolutely be malicious code in there. I think someone, there were some posts out on the, the, some of the Docker communities around the fact that, you know, they ran all the Docker images that existed out on the hub, and they said that something like 60 or 70 percent of them uh, were subject to one of the major vulnerabilities out there, whether it was shell shock or heart bleed or uh, some of the different vulnerabilities. So you still have to do your due diligence whenever you pick out images from the Docker hub um, and making sure that, you know, you're not running some type of vulnerability there. So there's both security and just vulnerabilities that are out there from a a Docker Hub perspective. So there's some other questions out here. So how do you back up the file system from inside the container? Do you back up the entire Im container image? So he talked about the, the union file system that's, that Docker runs on. It's uh, it's basically like this layered file system. Every time you make a change, the basically the disk between what you made and, and the previous version is given a, uh, a SHA, right? So it gets, there's this hash associated with that. So every time you go and you install a new package or you, you install a new, uh, or you run a different command or the file system's changed, then that's actually, that gets a layer as a layered file system, right? So if you end up installing some packages or installing some things, or you want to base another image so let's just say you have a Ubuntu image, you run, you, you install Python on it, and then you install Flask. And then you go back and you go, you know what, I really need another image that doesn't have Flask on it, that just has Ubuntu, or just has Python. So you can go back and you can build an image based on the, the SHA ID of that container uh, with just the Python image in there. So, uh, you know, you, you can actually build these kind of layered images on that. And whenever you download a new uh, image down from the Docker Hub, it'll have all that history. So ideally, the images you get from Docker Hub would be, you know, fairly simple. They wouldn't have that, that much of a change history there. But there's going to be certain scenarios that were, if, if you end up making a lot of changes to these uh, images, then you're going to have a lot of uh, changes in there. So typically what people end up doing is building new images whenever they have these types of updates. That way you're always pulling these fresh images that are, are fairly simple to work with. Uh, so one of the things, so I, I was showing you um, pretty much the metadata from the Docker PS. Um, it was showing you how long it's been up. It, it, also, it does give it a name if you don't put use a dash dash name file. But the other thing I wanted to show you real quick is the Docker Hub. Um, I could actually, uh, I have an account, but even if you, um, if you go, you can browse that. You go in there and use the browse, like here's the Ubuntu image. And remember I was talking about the tagging? Um, there's the latest, which is 1404, uh, but there's actually, if I actually wanted to pull like a 1504 or 1510, I could actually say colon Wiley or colon 1510.10. So, and, and again, all the images that you can ever think about. Nginx, there's the official Nginx. Um, I do, I've learned a lot by looking at some other people's. You find some people that you really like their style, because one of the things um, that I didn't show you is if you select here and uh, you you go into the tag data, it'll actually show you the Docker file of how it was built. So I've learned a lot from looking at different people's um, kind of Docker files and all that good stuff. So, uh, all right, so let's move back into the presentation. That was just a, a general, how do you find, how do you run, um, I mean the other stuff I can I can Docker um, I can Docker stop dollar sid uh, Docker ps there's nothing there but if I do a ps dash a it'll show me um, that it's actually um, not running 
So the PSX will show you ones that are actually stopped. So I could restart that just like we discussed. All right, so let's move on. Um, the, we just did the Docker installation, uh, the Docker plat I'm sorry, platform demo. Um, and then I do have two really good, um, again, tutorials. The first one is a little more, I spent a lot more time on the flags. And the, the four is a really good tutorial because um, I spent a fair amount of time um, working and showing you what the process looks like inside of the container. Um, in fact, let me just show you one real thick, quick thing here. Um, I could do, um, if I left the D flag out, if I said Docker, um, Docker run dash IT Ubuntu, I'm actually in the container right now. So that's the file system in the container, right? That's the host name. So if I exit out, it's gone. So that's uh, so. Anyway, I spent a lot of time, um, and then again, there's there's some complexities into whether you're running a single PID container or you want to run System D, and I, I show some examples of that as well. So, so again, I uh, I highly encourage the the mm -hmm. tutorials. Uh, the second um, example is <coughs> is building an image. So this is what you want to build your own image. So. Um, so I told you earlier that I, you know two and a half years ago I started playing with Docker and then um, then I've got sidelined by by that cloud foolishness. So I did a whole bunch of stuff with like OpenStack and different clouds and with my last startup the uh, Stratius. So I didn't play with Docker for about a um, for about a year and a half or so. Um, and you know when I got back in soccer playing I started playing with Docker again. But from what I remember originally, there was no Docker file, and I could be wrong about this. And what you did is you actually started, so if you actually wanted to maintain, like build your own image, you actually did a Docker run, and then you did your installs and configurations, and you ran a command called a Docker commit, and that saved out your own image. And you could still do that today. The problem with that model is, um, dare I say, it's not very DevOpsy. Because it's it's kind of a checklist model, right? There's no uh, there's no uh, source control. So the Docker file was a major improvement in that the, the things that you would have done manually once the container started, you could store as an artifact that is a, 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 an ASCII file that has Docker file commands in it, store it in GitHub, then run the build against it, and then create the image. So it's just a clean way to do um, image creation. So and that's pretty much the recommended standard is using. Uh, so in this example, we're going to build. Um, so I took a very watered down version of a Docker file. In fact, it's missing some uh, best practice stuff, like you want to put in a maintainer. And I just wanted to use the, just the basics here, just from a tutorial standpoint. And um, and I don't make any extra money if you go watch the tutorial. So, I'll, but I'll keep telling you the longer version of all this is in that. Um, in that um, tutorial, those tutorials. So I've got a, a part one and a part two. But so let's walk through this. The first part is showing you that first box is showing um, a Docker file. And so one of the first things you always see in a Docker file is a from statement, and it's basically saying what is the base image you want to build upon. In this case, I'm going to build upon the Ubuntu 1404, and this is a place where you should always use the tags, because if the latest changes and you've built something that's very specific, say, to 1404, um, you wouldn't want to get kind of um, screwed over later because it um, because the, the release changed and the default mm -hmm. later. So you definitely want to use the colon and specified tag. And then um, one of the primary statements you'll find in most Docker files is a run command. And so the run command is used so when it's cre it's the commands that you want to run when you're creating the image. Not when you're going to go ahead and run the image but when you're creating an image. So here I'm going to actually install Apache, but I'm also going to do an app get update. And another best practice is that you want to tie your update and your installs in the same command string. Because one of the things about a Docker file is it's um, what will happen is um, if you run a build, it will cache that on your Docker host. And then if you run the build again, if nothing changes, it doesn't run anything. But if any part of it changes, like the syntax of something on the run command or for files or other things, it actually does kind of a checksum, 
it will start uh, building from the point that the Docker file changes. So if you have your app get update on one run command and your install on the next, and then you change the install line, then you have a, a chance of the update not happening, which could make the install fail. So it's typically a best practice. What you'll see in a lot of well-behaved Docker files is all your installs will be in basically one run string. So like you'll have the, the app get update install um, with all the different um, entries on one install. And a lot of times they'll put them in alphabetical order so it's easy to kind of maintain. And then the next statement is an add. And um, the add statement is saying, when I'm building this image, <coughs> go ahead and take um, on the root directory from where I'm building this thing from, take a file called index.html. And I've got the example in the second box. It just says, it's just, uh, you know, uh, H1 Docker rocks, right? Um, and then, but put it in an image file directly, var dub 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 html index.html. So that's a way that you can kind of force um, data or programs or text files or whatever into the image when it's being built. The expose is basically telling, uh, it's a meta definition to say, I'm going to be using a port 80. Later on, there's some commands that will actually recognize that and make use of that, knowing that there was an expose in there. And then finally, um, the CMD statement is what is actually going to get run when you actually run the built image. In this case, we're going to run uh, Apache in the foreground. Um, and then there's, I remember I told you about that other video, the, the, the tutorial four. I spent a lot of time talking about the default single PID nature, of uh, process ID nature of a container. Uh, so in this case, um, if I run a command that just runs, the container will end, right? So in this case, I want it to be persistent. There are other ways to do that. You can run like a system D or, or uh, run it. There's other ways that you can run um, uh, multiple PIDs in a container. Um, but uh, most of the examples you'll see based on a kind of single PID, like in this example, you'll see things that are kind of run in the foreground. And so finally then, um, the last block is the command I'm going to do to build this image. So I'm just going to say docker build dash T. I'm going to call it Apache test, and I'm saying dot, which means look for the um, Docker file and the um, the actual um, any other files. In this case, the index.html that's on that directory, and then I can run this new image I've got. So, um, so let's try try to demo this, and hopefully the the thunder gods don't get mad at me again for doing demos. Um, all right, so um, so the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab, I'm going to create a file called Docker file. Now, um, I think prior to 1.4, 1.5, it actually had to be called Docker file. It doesn't have to be called Docker file anyway. It could be any file. There's a dash F flag on the build. I'm just going to use a Docker file to keep it simple. Um, and then... Uh, I'm just going to create that HTML file. Yep. Yeah, sorry about this. Just going to get my bearings here. Okay. All right, that's better. All right, so I've got my two files here, the Docker file, and then I'm just going to simply run the Docker build. And move that little dot there, just pull that up. Um, now, the good news is the 1404 was already on the system, so it didn't have to pull that. Um, and it is actually going to run the install Apache. That might take a minute or two. Um, so uh, why don't we uh, let's just give it a couple more minutes because it's doing the app get. Uh, let's see how fast my system is right now. Maybe it's maybe this won't take too long. I think we're almost done. Yep, there we go. So one of the things I might want to do real quick here is. Docker images. 
we should see there's a new one now called Apache Test. And then I should be able to run Docker Run ITD. Now, so notice there's this dash P here. We're getting a little glimpse of networking here. Um, remember I had that expose AD in there? So what the dash P does is says, there's two, two ways you can use port mapping. One is if you do the dash capital P, it'll say any of the exposed ports in the Docker file that are basically in this image now, go ahead and um, associate those with an ephemeral file. If I say dash lowercase p, I can actually explicitly uh, port map. So I could say like 8,000 colon 80. Um, so, um, so we'll go ahead and do this. In fact, if we do the Docker PS now, uh, we'll see here what it did is um, associated 32768 with 80, and uh, we're good to go. Um, so, um, and so if I want now, here's another cool command. That I, remember before I showed you the Docker inspect? Um, I can actually pull out just pieces from the inspect. So I can actually use what's called Go, uh, go Templating. So I'm saying instead of just running spec and give me everything, go ahead and use this format and just give me the IP address. And now if I echo dollar NID, um, it's 172.17.04. And so I should be able to do um, dollar NID. Oh, I don't have curl installed. Um, so anyway, that, uh, look. All right, so what we're doing that, um, um, let's go ahead and jump. I'll come back to this. It's just at that point I was just going to do the, um, oh, it's already back, so. Docker rocks, big. Okay, big deal. All right, so let's go back to the, um, the presentation. <coughs> That's your Docker file. Um, like I said, I do have a two-part series on this um, you might want to look at. All right, so the third workflow um, is um, basically volumes. So there's a couple of things about volumes. One is you can certainly create volumes inside the container. Um, also, you can also mount volumes outside of the container. In other words, you can mount a, a Docker host file or volume. So we'll show an example of that as well. So earlier I promised you I would talk about um, the images. So before you really can understand volumes, I think it's important to understand um, a Docker image. And this is from our documentation on Docker images. So remember I said we, we uh, by default, um, um, well, not really by default, all Docker images are based on some form of a union file system. The default is a UFS. Um, so what you have is the lowest layer, you have a boot file system, which is your kernel, and then you have some base operating system. So remember when I said from 14.04 in that Docker file, the base um, image for that would have been the, that Ubuntu. And then every time I, I do an add or I do a run statement from a Docker file, it builds another layer. That's another reason why you don't want to have a whole lot of run statements in there. And then um, when you run the particular image as a container, so you do a Docker run, the top level is a writable container. And that's where you get your copy on write. Um, so, um, and again, th that this model works really good for uh, testing. Like the, one of the early use cases, and, and it's a commonly used use case with Docker right now, is for continuous integration. So you might have an image that has like a Postgres database at a certain table state. And you could actually spin up that container in like um, you know four or five hundred milliseconds, run your test, and then kind of what they call um, go back to your baseline. And you could do that like there was an original test, uh, an original example, some vendor that that tested like a thousand variations of the same table state in a couple of minutes. Right? You couldn't with virtualization that would that would be a couple of days. Right? So there's like ridiculously interesting um, use cases. In fact, there's a great white paper by, uh, by, um, by Gartner right now about you know, their recommendation of how to use Docker. Um, and it, 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 it spends a lot of time on continuous integration because these delivery models, which seems to be one of the killer apps for, uh, for Docker these days. So, um, so here's, again, some workflow examples in the command line. 
Um, in this case, I'm doing a Docker run, um, and I'm, I'm actually purposely want to go into, so I'm doing a dash IT like we saw earlier. I am using the dash dash name, so I'm going to give it a job, call, job name called test job one. And I'm using this dash V, and I'm saying create a directory or volume called set slash temp one. Um, and then um, and then I can go in, I can create some files, I can stop the actual container by the container name, start it, and what I'll see is, as I promised earlier, um, that it's going to, those files, if I do that docker exec there with the ls slash test, um, I will see that those files will still exist. Um, this probably is obvious to everybody, but if I go ahead and run another container against that same image, and I do that Docker exec, those files will not exist, right? So it only exists for the life of a running or stop container. Stop or pause container. Once you remove, if you run another instance of an image, it's a completely different instance, right? Um, so, and the, the second example is kind of the more interesting one. This is where I can mount a volume. So in the second block, I've got this Docker run uh, dash itd dash dash name test job three. And what I'm doing there is I'm actually mounting the um, root file system of my Docker host from where I'm running to a volume inside the container at var dub 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 html and there and next html. So this is this gets really cool for like uh, I've seen a lot of people do this for um, like application config files. They might have their application config files on the Docker host and the apps inside the containers reference them, so they can actually uh, depending on the application and the behavior of the application, you could make changes to dynamically without having to uh, make any changes to the container, right? And then I'm getting the IP address, I'm curling it, and then I'm changing it. So let's uh, let's go ahead and go back into demo mode. Um, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that you trust me on the making changes. So I'm gonna skip to right to the uh, the uh, mounting on a host. Um, example. So, so I'm going to do the the second example. The other one is very simple. I can go in there, create files. If I stop it, not until I remove the uh, container, well, that that stuff be lost. But I want to use the second example just in case we lost a little bit of time in uh, the power outage. So I'm doing the run uh, itd test job three, and I'm just using the dash pw. I can put a specific directory. Right, and I have my. Um, I know that this file is actually on the root directory, and I want it to be inside of the container. Um, and what did I do wrong? Uh, oh, it didn't look like I clipped everything. Okay, that time it worked. All right. And uh, so let's go ahead and get the IP address of that. I mean, I could also do, I could do the Docker exec um, and then take the, or I could use the name, right? Right, but now if I go ahead and Update the index file. Let's just add some more bangs. I think I might, let's see right here. I've got to restart, so let's do the Docker. Um, Second. Oh, I got a different ID. Actually, I didn't have to actually restart that. I don't know why I didn't, didn't see the change. But, um, Docker exec IPA one seven two zero six. 
the the main point is ah that's weird what am i doing i'm doing something wacky here um all right we'll hope it's up to the demo gods but that's an excuse because there's something i'm doing wrong because it should be actually showing the change and for some reason um i apologize for that i'll have to figure out why something's not working i think it is uh, but the point being I, I i it should have showed me the changed um file uh, because uh, i'm using the uh oh i know what i was doing wrong i'm an idiot okay i was grabbing this one not this one Let's just use the name. All right. Five, that's why. That's a good example of how the uh, two are completely independent of each other, even though they're the same image. Sorry about that. Yeah, that was that worked the first time. I didn't have to restart it. Um, it was, I, I was being an idiot by grabbing the, the shortened SID of the wrong running instance. Once I grabbed the test job one, then I was in good business. Um, that's a quick rundown of your basics. Um, so let's see, um, the basic infrastructure of the product. Um, looks like I have about 15 minutes left. <coughs> Again, I have a whole tutorial on fun with volumes. Um, let me try to see if I can't run through the uh, networking really quick. Um, because uh, I know a lot of you guys want to understand the networking, um, and, uh, and so it, it, we'll see where we are in, in questions. And maybe what we can do is compile up some of the questions. But I'll go through this reasonably quick. It, it, the, the, here's the thing on the Docker networking. You basically have your basic networking, and it really is just um, uh, you know a bridge networking. So what happens is um, when, uh, when you install Docker, it basically creates a bridge called Docker Zero, uh, by default, it tries to get 172.17.42.1.16. And then every time you actually, if, you know, you can change this behavior, and some vendors have, and Soccer Plane was one of them. You can change this behavior. But by default, what it'll do is it'll create um, a VETH pair, virtual, internet, a virtual Ethernet um, and ETH pair um, for every container. And actually, it'll be in a network namespace as well. So it'll be isolated network namespace. So as you saw, it was uh, 172.17.05 and 6 that I got screwed up with. So that's your basic architecture. Um, and, you know, if you look at, you know, if I do an IPA here, and uh, this is my host system, this would be uh, one of the containers that, oh, the, 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 I'm sorry, this is the, uh, the Docker Zero bridge, and there's the bridge name. Um, if I run a container, I can see down here that I will get uh, a dynamically allocated virtual interface um, to the ETH um, of the uh, container. Uh, the other thing that Docker does by default, and you can change this behavior as well, is it sets uh, uh, IP tables, NAT rules, for um, for blocking a kind of container to container. That's why you have that whole port mapping. So I'm going to skip to what it looks like when I'm running a container. So I notice here, um, I won't go into gory detail, but I've run some containers um, that are going to be mapped from... Uh, port 80 to a dynamic port. So this would be very similar to one I just did with Apache. So you can do the um, pseudo IP tables, uh, dash T, NAT, dash capital L, dash N. Um, some of the Docker networking tools out there, um, there's some Weave, Flannel, two interesting ones. Uh, Join has just built a very interesting one called Triton, uh, Socket Plane. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a minute what we're doing with Socket Plane, what the Socket Plane team has been doing. Uh, very interesting stuff. The, uh, so there's a number of pretty interesting solutions out there. Um, the, the probably the most interesting thing has happened since Soccer Plane got acquired, um, which is um, the the guys, the development team that, that, that was part of my Soccer Plane company. Uh, they built this is about a couple of months ago. They, they created a new project called Live Network, and this is where all the action is going to be, right? So there's a project called Live Network. And so what, what Live Network now is, so prior to Live Network, in fact, 1.7 is the first release that actually uses Live Network. So what Live Network, so prior to 
you had some of the network code was in the Docker engine. It was also in something called libcontainer. Uh, now everything is in this live network, and it's a first-class citizen from a network perspective. It has a very robust API architecture. And it is the place where all vendors, including Cisco or any of the other vendors that do SDN or overlays, all are recommended to start building upon. So this is the future. Um, in the 1.7, all we've done really at this point is made live network work with the default uh, Docker bridge. So it's really more of a validation. But now from here, we're going to start building a lot more robust network um, structure. The, our, um, when live network was being designed, I was actually part of that discussion. Uh, we modeled some of the more popular, the Cisco ACI. We modeled the, uh, uh, the VMware uh, SDN architecture and some of the other vendors as well. So this is designed with those in mind. So this is where, again, where all the cool networking stuff's going to happen. Um, there's kind of a, a philosophy here of what we call the container network model. Um, so there'll be this notion of a default network um, and a default multi-host path and then uh, network APIs. And then um, I was hoping to see this in this version, but it'll probably roll out, trickle out, maybe 1.8, 1.9. Um, typically, our, our rollout cadences every other month, we usually come out with a release. Um, uh, I think what we'll see very shortly is a cool CLI. So very much like what we were doing, so, so, what the, kind of the soccer play is going to start, stuff's going to start showing up, where you can actually create a network. So you can kind of create your own overlay networks. And then when you start a container, you can associate with a network. Plus you'll also see uh, where a container can have multiple interfaces. Um, so this stuff is really going to get exciting, kind of starting from now and working our way through the end of the year. The, the guys are going to be doing some really, really cool stuff. Um, um, so that's kind of the, um, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the general overview. I, I do have some, you know, I've been talking about the tutorial series. I have, a, you know, you know, the Y Docker. I spent a, a really good blog article about that. Um, I also just recently done, if you want to understand more how you would use Docker from a um, kind of DevOps delivery perspective, I recently wrote a, a, a multi-part series called Docker and the Three Ways of DevOps. So that's been pretty cool. So all right. So it looks like we have like ten minutes. Uh, you know, again, that I think if I wouldn't have lost that ten minutes to the storm, we probably would have been in better shape. But um, let's go ahead and see if there's any questions I can answer. Um, if I can't, I'll get back to you. Again, I, I don't, I'm not proposing that I'm actually an absolute expert in this project, but I do have access to uh, to a bunch of experts. So, what do we want to do on? Um, should yeah, I? Yeah, we've got a whole bunch of questions off the uh, the Q and A. Jeff and I have been doing our best to answer some of these. Um, I know one of the first ones was, you know, what's the advantage of, of using Docker over just using traditional jails? Yeah, I mean, you know, so I mean, to each his own, right? So, but um, I would say that the, there's a couple of things, and if you go back to the Y Docker, and I just noticed, uh, thanks for David. I, I didn't see the chat. He was. I was I was doing that bonehead uh, grabbing the wrong container, David uh, Le Lefonvi. I'm sorry for maybe mispronouncing name. You were actually uh, pointing out the mistake I was making. But um, so the the Y Docker, I think I tried to explain that one. Like I mean, there's there's basic container stuff, but then um, you know again, if you think about what the the Docker people, the original engineers and architects, have combined a fair amount of complex. Linux things to give it um, some robustness, right? Um, you know, again, um, you know, adding the C groups, adding the kernel namespaces. You know, we've got a namespace for the mount names, a namespace for network. Uh, but then, more importantly, I think what's happening with the images and the workflow, and and we've seen the side effect of people sharing images have gone viral. And this, this happened with Chef when I first got there too. You know, cookbook kind of viral. So here again. Um, you, if you went with like you know some other form of containerization, you know, be it gels or um, you know your own version of a true or LXC or whatever, what you'd miss out on is this tremendous opportunity of sharing um, a community of just sharing uh, ideas and 
and and you know again from from your people there was a, I met a customer the other day a large um, bank actually where they set up a, um, a sandbox for all their big data so the problem they've had with their big data data scientists is it's hard for them to try like Hadoop or Spark or and there's all these different tools and variations and implementations and you know it could take them you know six months to figure out what's the best tool they've created a really cool sandbox of containers of all these tools and literally they can you know like I said earlier I tried out a tool this morning it took me three minutes so it, it's, it's that's one example and again there's just this vibrant community around docker right now and not only the the, the general web scale community but you know companies like Cisco and Microsoft and and IBM are all really just investing in this. So, um, you know, certainly there are companies that have done this kind of stuff without Docker. Um, a lot of stuff's not new, um, but but I think you would miss out on the opportunity of of a lot of sharing ideas and kind of a community of ideas. You know, rising tide lifts all boats. Cool. I know we also got a ton of questions toward the end on, you know, how do you segment these these uh, containers, right? So if you are all the containers on the same virtual machine, and how do you make sure that containers can't talk to each other? And you know, what's the advantage of doing NAT on those versus not doing NAT? And maybe a little bit more around, uh, you know, exactly how that would work. Yeah, I mean, so there's, you know, there, there, we're still emergent here in the terms of, uh, you know, nascent, I would say, in in how you know best practices. I mean, we've got a pretty strong architecture team, and they've been writing a lot of white papers and and slowly exposing them. Uh, you know, one of the first things that um, so one of the, there's three products that I didn't have time to mention, but I do have videos on. There's something called Docker Machine, uh, Docker Compose, and uh, Swarm. So Docker Machine is a tool to build. It's a command line interface to build Docker hosts. In fact, these days I build all my Docker hosts with with Machine. Nice thing is um, you can use TLS. You can it secures it. Um, you can. It's a great way to build machines and lock them down. So, uh, so I think Docker Machine. Look into Docker Machine first off. Um, second piece is so it gives you a level of control there. The second piece is um, uh, Docker Swarm is our orchestration solution. So I think if you're using Docker Machine and you're using some orchestration, we have one called Swarm. There's one called Kubernetes. Mesos has one. Um, there's some overlap between the three, um, but the point is when you use Docker Machine for kind of securing down access to a Docker host, you then use um, something like Swarm or an orchestration engine to um, allocate um, containers across multi-hosts. Um, once we have the uh, create network stuff in place, then you'll have really good isolated um, kind of uh, VXLAN encapsulation overlays from a network perspective. Um, so a lot of that stuff is getting cleaned up by using more of the advanced structures. And the network stuff isn't fully in place. Um, there still are a couple of things, you know, I, I, mean, I, I don't blow smoke up people's butt, but, you know, I mean, once you're on a Docker host, right, there's really no RBAC, you know, role-based access for what you can and can't do. Um, you also, if, if, if you wanted that Docker host to be multi-tenant, um, there's trade-offs on how I, I just covered the base um, the base networking. There's actually uh, about three other modes of how to run networking, um, and and but depending on what you choose, there are trade-offs, right? So you could make it more secure, and it's less less flexible. But um, you know, again, I don't think that's the 100% answer the uh, the questioner was asking for, but I think it's enough get you thinking about where we're going and how these things are going to eventually get solved. Okay. I know we also had some other questions around, you know, uh, you know, do you ever need to bypass Docker? Is pretty much everything all straight bare metal I.O. like we used to do with pair virtualization and, you know, uh, hypervisor bypass and some of those kinds of things? Do you still have to do those kinds of techniques within Docker? Um, well, you know, so again, the beauty of Docker is it is it is wire speed, right? That's the beauty because you are sharing the kernel, you're sharing the the, uh, the host operating system, so uh, that becomes a lot of the advantages of the product. Um, and there are I have seen examples of people using Docker with SRIOV and things like that. So so you can you can even use um, kernel bypass and stuff like that too. But 
but in general, um, you know, the, the, if you go back to my wide docker, right, it's lightweight. Um, it shares the kind of kernel and, and the operating system of the host. Um, the one thing I didn't mention in that is it is wire speed, so it is like bare metal. Um, now, if you're running all this under a VM, um, so, yeah, I mean, it begs the question, like, um, there are some companies that in production, they are literally using an orchestration engine like a Swarm or Kubernetes, and they're just um, orchestrating containers across multiple bare metal hosts, and that's how they run their containers in production. Um, there are a, a fair amount of people that actually run uh, their containers under VMs. Like, for example, Gilt um, is, has some really good stories about how they run Docker, G-I-L-T. They actually run uh, one container, one Amazon instance. Um, so I, I'm kind of a fan of the wire speed. And, you know, there's a Brian Cantrell, who's the CTO of Joint, says, you know, that God gets furious with us when we actually run containers and VMs. So I'm kind of of that school, so. And there was a lot of questions about security. Maybe you can touch a little bit on, you know, how do you get, how do you make sure you're downloading a secure image from Docker Hub? How do you make sure that, you know, I think there's a lot of kind of press out there saying that um, multi-tenancy within Docker is still kind of a work in progress. And it also sounds like on the networking side, there may not be that many controls to, or, or and maybe some of these are some of the other frameworks you didn't get into, but, you know, how yeah. do you make sure you, you prevent applications from talking to each other between containers on, on from a networking perspective? Those are great questions. So that's a three-part question, right? And, and help me if I, I'm getting old, I might forget the three parts by the time I get past the first one. But the first one is, I talked a little about this. I think that, um, you know, I mean, people who run ops and have good ops hygiene, you know, they, they kind of laugh about all the press about Docker having this many vulnerabilities. You know, so Banyan did a report about all the vulnerabilities of even the official images. Truth is, if they would have run that report against basically um, – all the puppet manifests or the uh, chef cookbooks, you'd basically find the same vulnerabilities. Those vulnerabilities are, they've been out there in, in versions of Bash and Apt and all those things, right? Um, the point is, I'm not defending that there's vulnerabilities in official Docker images. What I'm saying is, the people that I know that run stable operational hygiene um, know that you don't just pull things off the end and that and who it is. You have to take ownership. So what you'll find is, the companies that are moving closer are already in production with Docker, they basically build their own base images. So um, you, there's some really good examples of how to, there's an image called, there's an image called Scratch, which really isn't an image. And in fact, if you look at the Docker file for the Ubuntu or the CentOS or the Fedora, you'll see that they're from, it'll say from Scratch, and then they lay down the root file system of either they do a Debian boot or they use whatever you use for CentOS or Federa to lay down the root file system. And so they build their own kind of canonical base image, and then they'll layer maybe um, their, uh, their Tomcat. So they'll have their base image, everything's built from that. And then they'll layer their kind of uh, Tomcat version. So they'll build the Tomcat themselves from a from a, a, you know an image or a repository that they know has been vetted. And then they'll turn over those images, and typically they'll run their own Docker hub. Uh, more and more people are going towards our enterprise hub because it has a lot of scalability features, but they'll run their own internal hub, and they won't let their customers do generic polls or their users do generic polls, right? So, so hygiene is a problem that, you know, and again, this is not dissimilar. I'm not defending, but this is not dissimilar that we saw with, Chef cookbooks. Early days, chef cookbooks. There was this uproar about, oh my God, anybody can run a chef cookbook, and if they turned it on in production, who knows what could be in it, right? Like so. Um, so again, these are our operational hygiene and the networking question. Uh, you know, again, I think right now we're still a little bit nascent, um, but but like as we get closer to what we were doing with socket plane you'll see these scenarios where you'll actually create like a network called web or create a network called back end or front end. And then as you start containers, you'll start those containers in those networks. So you might have, you know, what I would expect to see very soon is something like a Docker network create, you know, 192.whatever.whatever slash 24. Right. And then, um, then that would be the network, and then you know, and then I would create a um, Docker uh, network create um, 
some other, you know, web two or back end, and then I create another network. And then you would actually start containers in these networks, and they would be by definition isolated. Um, and so you would be following. And then as other vendors start plugging into that CNM model, you'll start seeing um, like your Cisco ACI fill into the plug. And I know they're already talking to your guys. Um, you'll see other SDN-like vendors. So all that networking stuff will come directly from the customer's chosen favorite, you know, kind of SDN solution. So that part will be solved. Um, you know, the, the kind of, again, I alluded to that. Right? I'll take the, I think, was your second point of the three, which is, you know, how do you um, control access, you know, between containers? Um, there are still some nascent things that still need to get resolved on, you know, basically risk versus feature capabilities. Again, I can, I can build a very locked down Docker environment, but then I'm going to lose some, some of the power and feature flexibility of Docker. Um, I can build an environment that's actually um, less secure but more flexible. And then that comes down to Docker hosts. Are they multi-tenant? Do they have to be multi-tenant? They can be multi-tenant, but, but again, um, there's going to be a fair amount of lockdown that actually is going to make some of the complexity. And, you know, again, there are some other cool vendors out there trying to solve this problem. I listed some of those network vendors, uh, Docker networking vendors. So so one in three I feel real comfortable about. You know, um, two, I mean, the kind of the, the, the container to container or container access to host stuff, depending on how you run, how secure you run the containers. In, in my opinion, is still a little bit of an open item. But we do have a good security uh, um, white paper that we just produced, again, on our blog. So smarter people than me have spoken up about this subject. Cool. We also have a number of questions. I'm sure you guys get this all the time, too, is what's the state of Docker with Windows? I know they've seen a couple oh, yeah, announcements yeah. been out there. Really, really exciting stuff there, right? So, um, you know, there's, a, there's your kind of old classic you can run. We have this thing called Boot to Docker. Um, where it's a it's basically a very one clickish, you know I, I can on my Mac I can run this thing and it basically will install and it'll fire up uh, Ubuntu ISO on VirtualBox on the machine so I, don't, I can be pretty much I can get this thing up. In fact, we have this thing called Kitematic, which is even simpler. It's a GUI based interface for boot the Docker. And literally, if you go to Kitematic, K I T E M A T I C dot com, and we own those guys. They're uh, we, we acquired those a while back. Literally, you download it, you run the Kitematic, and it just brings up images. And, and I just did a, a tutorial on that yesterday. But um, anyway, so that's for OS X, for your Mac. But, but um, we, they also are starting the, uh, uh, the, the beta for, for the Windows version. So here's the Windows story, right? So you can run on a Windows, you can run, you know, boot to Docker, which will run VirtualBox, and then we'll run... Um, run the Ubuntu on it, but that's not what you really want. What's happened here is Microsoft, and I believe we'll see a lot of announcements next week at DockerCon, so, but a lot of this has been already expressed. So Microsoft has actually built um, a Docker compatible client, or uh, yeah, a Docker API compatible client for Windows 10. And so starting, again, I, I don't, don't quote me because I haven't actually hadn't had a chance to play with the Windows stuff yet, but the idea is Microsoft is providing the first, kind of a first end-to-end -end open source delivery of a doc. So they're, they're going to run native containers, so Windows containers on a Windows operating system that talk to the Docker engine in the API compatible. So, the, so and I haven't tried this yet, but the bottom line is you'll install Docker on a Windows machine their implementation of their client, and you'll be able to run Docker PS, Docker Run, you know, basically uh, there'll be a couple minor idiosyncrasies maybe in flags, because Windows is different than Unix or Linux, but in general, um, you know, within a really short term here right now, um, you're gonna be able to run uh, first class containers in a Windows environment, um, which is just gonna be like ridiculously exciting. Does that, does that still follow the run your Docker container anywhere, you know, on your laptop, in the cloud, whatever? Do you still have to make a distinction at that point whether it's a Windows container or not? Cause, you know. Yeah, that's the part I've, I'm not up to speed on yet, I, you know, I, uh, is that, you know, um, I mean, again, if you're using the kind of boot to Docker and VirtualBox, right, which is not great, right, then it's a run container. 
build container run container anywhere. Um, you know, I, I think, um, again, I don't know, but on the Windows side, it might be isolated to Windows, but uh, I would have to imagine it would be. But, but there, it could still be the beauty of that, though, is to kind of run anywhere. So run on a Windows bare metal, run on Windows VM, run on Azure, right? Um, run on Windows on, on Amazon, run on Windows on, uh, on GCE. Again, all this has to flush out in terms of, you know, integration and, and converge when it all gets converged. But, but the idea, I think, isolated to Windows, um, it would be a run anywhere in a Windows environment. And which, again, could be pretty exciting that you think of all the places I just described it. It possibly would run that binary without any change. So I know, I know we got some other more kind of uh, specific networking questions too, a number of them. Um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll just ask, you know, where is a good place to get some more specific networking questions about Docker? Um, you know, if you want to go look that up, do you have to go look at source code, or is, is it is it on the well, I would, Docker I would, blog? If you're a developer, I would definitely consider. I would definitely recommend diving into uh, live, live uh, network live network. So it's GitHub Docker slash live network. Um, we do have um, uh, there's the Google mailing list. They keep saying they might shut it down and put on something else, but I answer questions on it all the time, so it seems to be alive and well. Um, so the Google, um, the Docker Google mailings is, um, you know, I think uh, I, I don't go on to IRC as much, but IRC and and if you do, so you know, Madhu Venkapali was my chief engineer and co-founder with me in Soccer Plane, and the guy's amazing. So, and the team he built, um, and where I can get, so if you have questions, um, john.willis at docker.com, I will get you in touch with the team who is basically, I mean, the most exciting thing about Docker for me is, um, is you know, and it, it sounds like, oh, well, that's your company, John, but the, the luckiest thing that happened to me in the last couple of years is running into Madhu Vengapali and becoming a, and being a business partner of mine. And I will tell you that Docker networking is in as good a shape of the future as it can get because Madhu and his team, and uh, you know me too, me and Madhu like brothers. We start the company together. So the point is, John Willis at Docker dot com, and I will get you to the people who know the hardcore answers. I know one of the questions was, can we have multiple interfaces per container? Can we put those in multiple subnets? That's coming. That's that. That is that. You know, we had that in soccer plane. Um, you know, the the thing that what happened when soccer plane got acquired, they were like, we love this stuff. But we want to make sure because we were very specific with Open vSwitch only, right? We're native Open vSwitch, which I think is awesome. But the, the idea was let's make sure this works for everybody. So we've they, those guys have kind of stepped out and built a horizontal structure so that any of the SDN vendors can play. And so we're we're dangerously close to getting me back to where we were when I was doing socket plane demos. And, and the answer is yes. You'll be able to have your own subnets. Again, there'll be a command that will look very similar to something like Docker Network Create, you know, Web 1 or front end, and then you'll give it, um, you know, an IP range slash whatever as its network. You know, 192.10.10.1, you know, and then as web, and then 192.10.11.1 slash, you know, 24, um, you know, and that will be... Uh, load balancer, right? And so you could then create all these networks and then and then start containers in the network. So you guys should be able to see this. Yeah. So this is this is it, right? So it's it's all on the wiki. Um, you know, there's a there's a mailer. So I know some of you guys have been forwarded this invitation. So I may not know who you are or where you're from. So when we send out the feedback and some of the notes from the meeting and whatnot, I usually send it out to the mailers. So you may want to go out to the the mailers and subscribe there. It's a, a Google mailer. All the recordings and all the history we've done. So this thing's been running about a year or so. There's a I don't know, maybe 15, 20 or more recordings of different types out there on the wiki. So cs.co/inpughistory, um, and there's a you know advisory group of, of us that kind of run and, and do these things. So if you have feedback, if you know someone's a really good speaker, right? So we're doing uh, a whole bunch of stuff on DevOps in the next month. We're still looking for you know people to talk on that. Um, Beyond that, we're probably going to talk, you know, configuration management or maybe a little bit about OpenStack or maybe a little bit about development. So if you have someone you know that's a really good speaker, let me know. Um, the, the group's in multiple cities now, so, we, you know, we're running in Kansas City and 
think St. Louis and Chicago, New York City, RTP, and out on the West Coast as well. So uh, if you're interested in starting a group or something like that, let us know at the advisory email. Uh, again, feedback, speakers, and those kinds of things. Um, and we'll, we'll send feedback and the recording out to the mailer as well. And we'll send it out to the, some, some of the Cisco aliases that we sent this out to. So I appreciate everyone's time, especially John. I know the thunderstorm's no fun, but you know we really appreciate the time and everything. So. Uh, thank you, everybody.